Pawn Stars has been a consistent part of the History Channel's programming since it first debuted in 2009. Some episodes are filled with some really killer items that have some awesome history to them. But with all the successful sales that have taken place over the show's 675 episodes, there was bound to be some failure. Stick around to check out 10 times that Pawn Stars got scammed. You already bought this? That sounds bad. It's a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. Number 10. The Jimi Hendrix Guitar In the 2014 episode of the hit show, shop owner Rick Harrison was in awe at a 1963 Olympic white Fender Stratocaster that had allegedly been played by the Purple Haze musician himself, Jimi Hendrix. Oh, this is your guitar? Yes. Okay. It's a 1961 Fender Stratocaster. Now, anyone who has seen the show would know that Rick is a massive fanboy for anything related to music, particularly rock and roll. The guitar was so special that Harrison even said, if this was actually owned and played by the legend himself, this would be the coolest guitar ever to walk into my shop. So when it came time to make the sale, the Pawn Stars King made a couple of calls to get an expert's authentication on the guitar before actually purchasing it. Jesse Amoroso from Cowtown Guitars made an appearance in the episode as he confirmed that the Fender was, in fact, played by Hendrix back in his heyday. He recalled the signature scuff marks from the left-handed musician as well as provided historic photos of Jimmy playing the guitar. Rick's face lit up and he was like a kid in a candy store as he started negotiating for the instrument. My, my thing is, I take all the risk, you walk away with the cash. However, they couldn't strike a deal with the customer who was trying to sell it, as the customer wanted around $750,000 for it. Yeah, I'm thinking seven fifty, dollars man. But Rick wouldn't go any higher than $600,000. Six? can't do it, man. What makes this failed purchase as possible scam is the fact that the guitar later went back on the market for sale by Cowtown Guitars, the same broker who authenticated it. Some claim that Amoroso was likely working on a backdoor deal for the guitar behind the scenes right under Rick's nose. Number 9. The Fake Rolex Incident As the son of the pawn shop owner, Corey Harrison practically grew up in the business, but that doesn't mean that he knew all of the ins and outs right off the bat. Instead, he had to learn a few lessons the hard way, including how to spot a fake Rolex watch. According to Corey, when he first began working the overnight shift by himself, he didn't have the same amount of experience that he has now. His customers discovered that they could pull one over on him when one of them attempted to sell him a fake Rolex watch, which he bought, thinking that it was the real thing. News spread fast that the pawn shop was purchasing fake watches for the prices that they would buy the real ones. According to Corey, within a week he had purchased six different fake Rolexes, costing the shop around $4,000. This hit really ticked off Corey's family, but he learned his lesson and eventually figured out all of the tricks to spotting the difference between a real and a fake timepiece. Number 8. Dealing with Stolen Diamonds You know the song, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Well, they're a pawn shop's worst enemy. Whether it's dealing with fake jewelry or pieces that were stolen, more often than not, it ends up being troublesome to deal with diamonds that someone is trying to pawn off for a price. Rick Harrison learned that the hard way one time when he was working in his store. He talked about the mistake in a 2010 segment on the History Channel where he explained that a well-dressed man entered his store. Guy in a suit comes in the pawn shop, got a big set of diamond earrings. He walked up to Rick hoping to sell a pair of diamond earrings. Now, Rick was no rookie so he began asking all the standard questions. And surprisingly enough, the seller had all the answers that he needed. At the end of the transaction, Rick ended up paying 40 grand for those earrings. The man walked out of the store with a smile on his face, but three days later, the police came in looking for the same set of earrings. They explained to Rick that the diamonds had been stolen and the pawn shop owner did the right thing and returned them to their proper owner. That being said, Rick was still out $40,000 that couldn't be reimbursed. According to Rick, that was the biggest bust I ever had in the pawn shop. It's the biggest bust I ever had in the pawn shop. Number 7. The fake strong box that made the Harrisons look foolish. When a customer came into Rick's shop with a Wells Fargo strong box that was supposedly from the 1800s, the owner's face lit up. Wells Fargo strong box, antique ball and chain. What made this particular strong box so special was basically the notoriety behind it. The strong boxes became an iconic piece of Western history to the point where you will find Wells Fargo strong boxes in the background of most Western films and games in the media today. In other words, it's a collector's item. Rick haggled for the box and got the seller down from $1,200 to $450, which he probably thought was a steal. However, when Rick had the box authenticated, 
Mark All Patton from the Clark County Museum basically called the piece a complete fantasy item. He claimed that it's one of the most commonly faked items on the market, and that's exactly what Rick got his hands on. Rick really should have known that the strong box was fake considering the same person he bought it from tried to sell him a fake ball and chain from Yuma Prison in the same transaction. Number 6. The Robosaurus Ripoff In this scenario, Chumley, the shop's notorious knucklehead, almost cost the shop a million dollars. You see, Chumley somehow stumbled onto what he thought was the deal of a lifetime, a 31-ton fire-breathing T-Rex that had been dubbed the Robosaurus. This massive dinosaur robot looks awesome and supposedly fed on cars, trucks, and even small planes. The seller claimed that you could rent it out for things like demolition derbies or even bar mitzvahs for up to $25,000 a day, which is why he was asking for a million dollars. Thankfully, Rick had the final say and said no thank you because it turned out that the machine wasn't worth nearly that much. According to reports, the Robosaurus sold years later for just over half a million dollars and has been out of commission since 2015 due to a shoulder injury. Number 5. Taking a $30,000 hit over some fake diamonds Richard Harrison, aka The Old Man, had been in the bond business for quite some time before the shop ever got a show on the History Channel, and he claimed that at one point, he cost the store nearly 30 grand when purchasing fake diamonds. According to Harrison, when cubic zirconia, the synthetic and fake diamond, first came into play throughout the late 70s, nobody really knew about them. He claimed that almost every pawn shop in the country was tricked by these fake diamonds because there weren't the proper ways to test them back then. The old man claimed that even though they don't pose a threat to diamond dealers today, back when they first hit the market, he purchased nearly $30,000 worth of fakes, which was a massive financial hit back then. Number 4. The Gibson Mandolin Back in Season 4 of the show, a man came in looking to sell his supposedly vintage Gibson Mandolin. The seller was hoping to earn enough money from selling the mandolin to afford a trip to Ireland for himself and his family. I'm looking to sell it today because I'd like to take the family on a trip to Ireland. Chumley acted like he knew enough about Gibson mandolins to determine whether or not it was worth picking up, and even explaining that they were from the early 1930s. No, I know a little bit about these things. They're from the early 1930s. He recalled a time that Rick was very excited to see one come into the shop a few years prior. We had a lady bring one in from the early 1900s, and Rick practically drooled all over it. And decided to purchase the instrument, thinking it would have the same effect. Chum managed to bring the seller from his initial sale offer of $3,000 down to $1,500, thinking that he made the purchase of a lifetime. However, from the second that Jesse from Cowtown Guitars picked up the instrument, he knew it was a fake. The first thing that he said about the mandolin was that the Gibson decal wasn't accurately laid into the instrument, and that the font for the G was entirely off. The look on Chumley's face couldn't even begin to describe how upset Rick was that not only did his employee go over his $1,000 spending limit, but it wasn't even on an authentic item. Number 3. The Austin Healy Sprite Rick found himself in deep trouble after purchasing an Austin Healy Sprite that he thought would earn him big bucks. Rick has always been a sucker for a nice vintage car, so when he had the chance to purchase a rare Austin Healey Sprite, he couldn't have been happier. In fact, Rick didn't even seem too upset that the car wouldn't start when he first tried to turn it on. The seller quickly claimed that it was an easy fix and that Rick could get the car started for next to nothing and sell it for nearly five times what Rick bought it for, which was $5,000. However, when Rick brought the car to his mechanic, he got some bad news. According to the mechanic, in order to fix the car up and even make it sellable, Rick would have to put a minimum of six grand into the car, which is $1,000 more than he bought it for. Hopefully, Rick learned his lesson and stopped buying cars that wouldn't even start. Number 2. Willie Mays Uniform Corey cost the shop $31,000 on a Willie Mays San Francisco Giants uniform that he believed was from 1961. A lot of fans of the show still rag on Corey for this to this day because the red flags were apparent in this sale from the very beginning. When the seller came into the shop claiming that he had Willie Mays' uniform, even Chumley seemed confused by how clean it was. According to Chum and everyone who knows anything about baseball, a used uniform from the 60s would not look pristine. It would have been covered in dirt from sliding from base to base. Willie Mays was a badass. He was sliding around in the dirt and the grass. I imagine there would be a bunch of stains on it. On top of that, the seller didn't have any way to authenticate the uniform. He didn't have any paperwork at all. Any paperwork or anything with you? Or? No, I don't. OK. That being said, Corey still thought that it would be dumb to pass up on the uniform and ended up paying 31 grand for it. 
Interestingly enough, there was nothing in the news that the item was fake. But because it couldn't be properly authenticated, they couldn't retail the uniform at the ridiculous price they expected. Instead of getting $80,000, which is what they wanted, they ended up selling the uniform for $19,200, ultimately costing the shop almost twelve grand. Number 1. And sticking with the theme for sports memorabilia, let's talk about that ridiculous Shoeless Joe Jackson autograph that the pawn shop purchased. It was in the episode, Say It Ain't So, from season 6 when Rick made a fatal mistake. A seller came in with a book that he believed was signed by the baseball legend Shoeless Joe Jackson. Have a book signed by Shoeless Joe Jackson. As Rick was looking at the book, you could see the excitement on his face. He claimed that the autograph was incredible and even figured it might be the rarest signature in the history of sports. Rick purchased the book for a total of $13,000 without even consulting with an expert. I guess he was just too excited. Too bad for Rick, when he did finally consult the expert, Rebecca, she claimed right away that the signature was likely a fake. Rick didn't like hearing that though and sent the book out to another authenticator who gave him an even worse response. Not only was the signature fake, but according to the expert, it was a laughably bad forgery. Which of these scams would upset you the most if you were a pawn shop owner who just found out you were duped? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss any more rad history.